Well, hello, dear ones. Hello, family. You are at home. You're at home with Jim and Joy. You're an important part of the EWTN family. We want to hear from you throughout the show. 205-271-2980 or 800-221-9460. Jim and Joy at EWTN.com. Uh, when somebody's in your home, you want to hear them. <laughs> you want to hear them speak and share and and we just rejoice that God is working all things together for good for those who love him and who are fitting into his plan. Joy, we're nearing Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. and we want our hearts to be filled with Thanksgiving, and I know you have some thoughts about that. Well, we have so much to be thankful for. We do. Um, even if the results don't turn out the way that we anticipated. And we're going to have a great guest in Chad that we'll talk about a little Chad later. Judy's. And he gets, he gets to tell his story. Um, but yesterday, um, in my quiet time, I am um, in the Magnificat, which is a great... Um, you know, a periodic, it helps you, it has all the mass readings, has saints of the day. It's a great devotional for all of us on our journey. So yesterday, in about being thankful, um, there was an author, and her name was Anne Voskamp, and she wrote a great book called 1,000 Gifts, and it was a New York Times bestseller list. And she was with a friend, and a friend challenged her to say the thousand things. Why don't you just come up with a thousand things that you're thankful for? Wow. To really cultivate a, um, a habit of virtue, of thankfulness. You know, because sometimes you'll hear people say these rather trite things, like um, you need to count your blessings and not your troubles. And that's true. But sometimes when you're really troubled and you're really hurting, mm -hmm. that's really hard to do. It's just really hard to do. So how do we cultivate uh, being thankful? Well, one thing is we, we have to go to the Word, and we have to hear what happens in the Word and how we suffer and whether sufferings come our way, our attitude towards suffering. And um, I, when I had a cancer diagnosis and I knew I was suffering, my response to my suffering was that I wanted to suffer well. And I didn't know what that meant, actually, because I never had chemo running through my veins. But I just presented my body as a living sacrifice and said, Lord, I don't know what this journey entails, but I want to suffer well. And at the end of it all, and 11 years out of it, I'm thankful for cancer. And I'm like, that doesn't make sense. But yes, I'm thankful. I'm thankful for cancer. That that happened to me, that, that that suffering and that experience, I got to journey with Jesus because it was an encounter with the living God to know how, what first of all, what I really, really believed in. You know, we all say, I believe in Jesus, I love Jesus, God is good all the time. Well, sometimes all the time, all the results aren't good, but God is still good, and God is kind, and God loves us. So yesterday, in my quiet time, I was reading, and I, you know, we shared with you a couple of weeks ago that we lost uh, one of our grandchild with um, a miscarriage. And so the Lord in my quiet time asked me to thank him that Lucia Grace was with him. Now I'm listening to my daughter cry every day and that was really hard. And I just sat there and I thought, that doesn't make sense. Her womb <laughs> is empty, we want the baby. The whole miscarriage was hard. Um, it was traumatic, and, um, and I just sat there because that was the right thing to do. And so I thanked God that Lucia was with Jesus. And, um, and I don't know what happened, but this is the mystery of suffering. When we participate with the living God, like things changed in my heart after that. I, I felt like I moved from another place where I was stuck, maybe in my grief process, to another place. Um, I still, we still don't have Lucia in our arms, but Jesus has her, and that's, and now she was a prayer partner in heaven with us, and that's what we believe, and we, and we, you know, we suffer well, and so I just wanted to share that with you about being thankful, um, because we all want to be thankful, no matter what the storm is in our life. God is good and God is kind, and in the scheme of it, maybe not in the heat of the moment, we don't get it. But in time, it all matters in the mystery of life and in the mystery of suffering. So I'm thankful, and I'm going to continue to be thankful. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. And we want to hear from you. What are you thankful for? 
email us at jimandjoy at EWTN.com. Maybe we'll share your thought about being thankful on air. jimandjoy at EWTN.com. Well, we're going to a break. We're going to have Chad Judice with us. He was asked, what do you fear most? What do you fear most? And then shortly thereafter, what he said he feared most came to pass. And he went from fear to faith. You're not going to want to miss this incredible testimony. God does work everything together for good for those that love him. We'll be right back. Don't go away. We want to hear from you. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Well, you are at home with Jim and Joy, and we want you to be a part of this show. It's live, it's interactive, and we want to hear from you. So give us a jingle at 205-271-2980 or call us toll-free 1-800-221-9460. You can always send us an email, jimandjoy at ewtn.com. Well, here we are in our beautiful home, and we have this wonderful guest yet again, and his name is Chad Judice. Chad, welcome to At Home with Jim and Joy. Thank you so much for having me. Well, Chad, you are the father of a son who has spina bifida, and you, um, in this whole evolution, you have a great story to tell, but it's not Eli's story. It's not Chad and Ashley's story. It's God's story. Mm -hmm. And God is doing a great and mighty work in your heart and in your family and with a great reach and how it's affected so many people. But what I want you to do is I want you to tell us the story about when one of your students asked you a question and how that became the catalyst for all the things that God has done in your life. Well, in May of 2005, I was finishing up my last year at a Catholic middle school and making a transition to a neighboring Catholic high school and I had all the academic requirements of the year met so I allowed some students to ask me some personal questions and I could decide if I wanted to answer them or not. And a young man in the back of the room had his hand up and I gave him a chance to speak and he asked me something I never been asked before. He said, hey coach, what's your greatest fear? Wow. And I told him my greatest fear would be to have a child with a mental or physical handicap mm. because I was such a perfectionist. I didn't think I'd handle that very well. Having no idea that in four short years my greatest fear would become my reality. In the midst of our second pregnancy, a 16-week ultrasound revealed our second child was diagnosed with a birth defect so severe that 80% of the couples who get the diagnosis we do at that point in our pregnancy choose abortion. Mm -hmm. And my wife and I chose to pray for a miracle. When I've shared this story around the country with different groups of people, and I introduce it that way, I always like to tell people that it's not just a story about a little boy with a disability or the obvious pro-life message in the story. So much is it, it's a story about how sometimes the greatest opportunities we have to grow in our faith mm. during our times of trials, our sufferings, and our difficulties. And we choose to embrace those things with Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. He can do the same thing with our cross in the 21st century. Right. He does with his in the first. And he can take what the world would say is a tragedy and turn it into a triumph. And I like to follow that up by saying, listen, if you don't have a child with a special needs, you know, people might wonder, well, how does this apply to me? Mm -hmm. And I say to them, you know, we all have crosses in our life. Some of them are big or some of them are small. Just put your cross in the place of that little boy and you're going to relate to everything I'm going to be talking about and everything I wrote about in those books. Mm -hmm. So you have, you have three sons. I do. And Eli is your second son. He is. And so when you and your beautiful wife, Ashley, when you got the diagnosis and, you know, you, here you are in this pregnancy and, and you had to confront that fear, did you ever, did you entertain abortion? Did, how did your faith form you to say, well, we, we're going to go the distance with this. It was a really um, palpable moment that night when we got the diagnosis from the maternal fetal specialist that our, that our son had spina bifida. Mm -hmm. And I want to mention to the audience that my wife is a neonatal intensive care mm -hmm. unit nurse at a hospital in Lafayette, Louisiana, where, we, where we're from. And she does see the worst of the worst every day in what she does. But at the time we got this diagnosis with Eli, there were no neurosurgeons on staff at her hospital. 
And those are the types of physicians that have to provide the care that children with that type of need have following birth. Mm -hmm. So she really didn't know a whole lot about the condition and I knew absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. And as we sat at home that night reading the, the information we had been given by the uh, specialist, it was little less than encouraging. Mm -hmm. I mean, 80% of the people that get this diagnosis choose abortion. 75% mm -hmm. of children with this severe of a birth defect will cause a miscarriage prior to 20 weeks. Mm -hmm. And as we read on further that night, we came to realize that should our son survive the pregnancy, that within 24 to 72 hours after birth, he would need major surgery on his spinal cord and on mm -hmm. his brain. Mm -hmm. And even if those were perfectly <laughs> successful, you know, we were told our son would never walk. Mm -hmm. He would be severely mentally disabled and he would have numerous health problems. And I remember my wife sitting across from me in the room reading this and tears running down her face. Mm -hmm. And she looked up at me and she said, I'm going to hell. Mm -hmm. I said, Ashley, what are you talking about? She said, I'm actually thinking about aborting this baby. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and in that moment, I really attribute it to the Holy Spirit giving me the fortitude to stand up and grab her and say, hey, you know, this is not your fault. This is not my fault. You know, God sends his child for a reason. Let's trust in God, the way our oldest son Ephraim trusts in us. Mm -hmm. And I was referencing when Jesus is teaching to the crowds and he calls the little children around him. He says, hey, you know, the kingdom of heaven, it belongs to such as these. And his message is really simple, but it's so profound. Mm -hmm. He wants all of us to be as, you know, trustworthy and dependent on God mm -hmm. as a small child is on their parent. Mm -hmm. And the following day, you know, we made the decision in love, which is the opposite of fear, to go forward with this pregnancy. And I went back to the high school I was teaching at and it was a Thursday and it was a mass day. And as the priest rose to proclaim the gospel, I could barely believe my ears. As he said, it was from Matthew chapter 18, verse three through five, you know, mm -hmm. amen, amen, I say to you, unless you become like this child, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one child such as this in my name mm -hmm. receives me. And I knew when I had, you know, referenced that to my wife the night before, and it was read out loud the following day in mass. Those were your marching orders. God told me what mm -hmm. to do. And a good friend of mine came up afterward who had known what was going on. He invited the entire community to pray for our son. Mm -hmm. And he began a journey of faith, hope, love, the power of prayer that has exclamation points in it with little miracles along the way that shows God does not take our suffering away from us, mm -hmm. but he does promise to be with us, you know, through it every step of the way. And it climaxed with Eli's birth in February of 2009. Mm -hmm. Well, you wrote a book waiting for Eli. And is that what that means, that waiting, that process of, of pregnancy and, and you got this diagnosis and people are praying and you're just waiting to behold the face of this child and the actuality of all this? Yeah, I think it's, it's a good title because it talks about the, the, the perseverance and the term of endearment that my wife and I undertook and the cross that we put on our back mm -hmm. and carried to Calvary, mm -hmm. you know. And I, I tell my students as a Catholic theology teacher in the high school that everybody has a Paschal mystery to live in their life. And, you know, you might be the only Bible somebody ever reads. Mm -hmm. And if Jesus Christ cannot retell his story through you, then somebody may never meet Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And I love Venerable Fulton Sheen when he says, you know, you can't have Easter Sunday without Good Friday. Mm -hmm. And I look at that waiting period you asked about yeah. as our Good Friday. Mm -hmm. And I look at the birth and what's come after it as Easter Sunday. Wow. So tell us about moving towards the time of delivery and what the delivery was like and how severe was the spina bifida, what, what took place? Well, when Eli was born in February of 2009, uh, doctors as well as our family were pretty astonished at the fact that, you know, medical science says that most children with this type of disability are gonna have an opening in their back the size of a softball, mm. which is where the neural tube, which is your spinal cord, connects to your brain. It floats out into the amniotic fluid during the pregnancy. And supposedly as the pregnancy continues, that opening gets larger mm -hmm. and the, the, the prognosis for paralysis and all the health problems increase. Well, throughout the entire pregnancy, we got sign after sign that God was with us and we didn't get confirmation about the size of that opening until he was born. And instead of being the size of a softball, it was the size of a 50 cent piece. Mm. And you know, if any of your viewers would just look up about any information about spina bifida, they would come to realize that based on where his lesion is, the opening on his back, you know, he shouldn't be able to do the things physically he's capable of doing. And he only spent three weeks in a hospital after he was born and he was released. And it was almost three years before my wife and I had to bring him back to that same hospital to be treated for something again. Mm -hmm. It really was a miraculous birth. And his life is such a witness to the value and dignity of every human person because his life has had an impact on so many people since he's been born and yeah. even before he was born, which I think makes it such a powerful pro-life story. You have an unborn child crying out from the womb, mm -hmm. you know, that's heard by a community of believers, mm -hmm. teenagers, right? you know, and whether they acknowledge mm -hmm. it or not, they, they, whether they realize it or not, when they prayed for him when he was in utero, yeah. 
Yeah. You know, they, they acknowledged he was alive. Mm -hmm. And when you read these books, you can see, you know, in examining your conscience that, you know, he truly has had impacted so many people yeah. before his birth and afterward, mm -hmm. moving into the present time. So you and your wife and the whole student body and the community of yeah. Lafayette, I mean, people were praying for a miracle. Yeah. Right? So what, what would that miracle have looked like? That the spina bifida would have been gone? God could have, I and mean, God could have, right? Sure. He could have miraculously touched your wife's wound and, and healed and done all that. But that didn't happen. No. And you and Ashley didn't lose faith. And you didn't curse God. No. And, and so, but, but then tell about the reach to that whole community about their faith journey. Well, one of the things that sticks out to me is one of the signs you mentioned that he wasn't, he wasn't healed. You know, mm -hmm. God didn't heal him. And I always say to people when I share some of the stories in my second book, Eli's Reach on the Value of Human Life and the Power of Prayer, that, you know, had God healed him, it would have been acknowledged, but quickly forgotten. Right. And instead, you know, God's reach into the lives of others through his imperfections has mm -hmm. truly been immeasurable mm -hmm. and has made this story really timeless. Mm -hmm. But you know, he didn't heal Eli, but he did heal me. Mm -hmm. And when we were, after he was born, I went to mass shortly after with my mother-in-law at a little mission parish. And I said a rosary before the mass started. And I've been praying it faithfully throughout the pregnancy, but I prayed it harder than I'd ever prayed it before. And as the priest rose that day and he made the sign of the cross, he said, we have a great gospel today. He said, you know, Jesus heals the paralytic. Mm. And he says to him, your faith has saved you. And I know you guys have heard me speak at a yeah. Uh, a pro-life banquet, pro -life banquet mm -hmm. before, and you've, you've heard me tell that part of the story. Mm -hmm. And when I give the talk, I say, you know, I, I know that I don't need anybody to tell me my son's going to walk mm -hmm. because God Almighty already has. But you know, when I hear that line, your faith has saved you, mm -hmm. as I've reflected on it in a deeper way over the last seven years mm -hmm. being his dad, mm -hmm. I realized that God wasn't talking about Eli that day. Mm -hmm. He was talking to me mm -hmm. and that I was the one that needed to be healed, mm -hmm. not my son. And by facing my weaknesses and my brokenness and carrying those things to the cross of Jesus Christ and giving them to him, you know, I have found resurrection. And, you know, what better way to do that than to send a perfectionist and a control freak, an imperfect child, mm -hmm. in a situation you know you're not in control in? If you can't surrender that to God, I don't know what you can. Mm -hmm. You know, Chad, you're so humble. And you and your wife, Ashley, and she's absolutely beautiful. And so docile just to share that because, yeah, I mean, we, you can be a control freak. You can be a perfectionist. And it's like, and as a man, you want to fix it, you know, and, and you can't, and you can't change it. You have to surrender to the process yeah. and believe that God's going to do a greater, and he's going to bring a greater good out of it, right? right? He reminds me so much of Joseph, mm. St. Joseph, you know, who, um, had to die to his dream, right? I mean, his dream was he's going to meet a nice, well, he did meet a wonderful Jewish girl. <laughs> right. It was going to be a normal, you know, engagement thing. They're going to get married. And then he finds her, you know, pregnant, you know, by the Holy Spirit, you know, I mean, he's like, but I mean, th this dying and, 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 and he must have had a degree of fearfulness and, you know, everything's getting readjusted or maybe he had a control thing too. You know, sure. I, I'm just got a surmising here, but you just remind me of Joseph, that that readjustment, radical readjustment that had to take place for him. I think he went through that, you know? Oh, how, how many times in the, in the narrative of the, in, Jesus' infancy, you know, when he has to flee to go to, to get the, you know, to, to, to Egypt to flee from, from Herod or to bring Mary right. to Bethlehem for the census. I mean, the man is constantly adjusting to his situation and he has to become the father of that particular of that child, child. Mm -hmm. and, and in, he has to become the man God is calling him to be. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, a, a lot of things have happened in my life that have shown me that, you know, my understanding of Jesus Christ is that he was born to die. And if he never would have embraced his cross, he never would have become who God created him to be. And I would never have become who God created me to be mm -hmm. had I never embraced my cross. Mm -hmm. And uh, Eli is that cross, but he's also the fruit of Easter Sunday and the resurrection. Right. And, and the great, great blessing of that. that yeah. Well, we are going to take a break, but we would like you to give us a jingle at 205-271-2980 or call us toll free 1-800-221-9460. You can always send us an email, jimandjoy at ewtn.com. We're going to take a quick break and when we come back, we will continue our discussion with Chad Juzis. Don't go away. You're at home with Jim and Joy.
Well, hello, dear ones. Welcome back. And we'd like to hear from you. Maybe you have a child with special needs. Maybe you've gotten a prenatal diagnosis that's a difficult one. Give us a call at 205-271-2980 or 800-221-9460. Send us an email now, jimandjoy at ewtn.com. We want you to be a part of this time, precious time, of sharing from fear to faith. Well, Chad, uh, it's just great to speak with you, and I admire you so much. And I've been trying to hold myself because I'm so moved by you as a man. And just, uh, you know, you, you said you've it's really, you've had a cross that's been laid upon you, yeah. and, and you've really taken it up so beautifully, so I just want to say that personally. But would you share with us, because I know I'm being impacted, and I'm just wondering some other people maybe that have been impacted that you've heard from, that Eli's life has uh, sort of evangelized them. Absolutely. I mean, I wrote my first book shortly after he was born, and I spent the next two or three years going around sharing the initial story, the one you guys heard at the uh, Pregnancy Crisis Center banquet. And I've got so much unsolicited feedback that inspired me to write a second book, which basically chronicles all these stories about other folks and how they came across, came across a cross in their life. And when they did, they encountered Eli's story. And I'm reminded of uh, John's gospel when Jesus is walking along with his disciples and they come across a blind man and they ask him, you know, uh, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus says, well, neither he nor his parents sinned, so that the work of God might be made visible through him. And I really feel like when people encounter Eli's story, God uses that story to make his work in their lives visible to them. And two examples I can think of that would explain that or, you know, give an explanation for that is they had a young couple that was in high school that had been dating their sophomore year all the way to they were seniors. And they were high school sweethearts and they got pregnant out of, you know, out of wedlock. And I can't imagine what it would be like to be 18 and find out you're pregnant and know you have to take care of another human being for the next 20 mm -hmm. years of your life when you're not really ready to take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. But on top of that, have some type of diagnosis being handed down to you like my wife and I got in the midst of our second pregnancy. And this couple soon came to discover that their unborn child would, would be born with anencephaly. Mm -hmm. And it's when a child is missing part of its skull and part of the brain, and it wasn't given a very good outcome. And the doctors were pushing them to have an abortion. Mm -hmm. A friend of their family had picked up my book at my family's restaurant in Lafayette and read it and she happened to be one of their teachers. And this mm. is at a public school, which I think makes it even more apropos yeah. because mm. God's not typically welcome there. And they really thought they were gonna have to have an abortion. And her and her boyfriend read the book. And when they got through reading it, they made the decision to walk in faith and keep their child, irregardless yeah. of what the outcome would be. Yeah. And when that child was born, it did die. But one of the beautiful things about Eli's story is that, you know, they went on and they had another baby out of wedlock. And I can't condone that because it's not what the church teaches, but you see, you said at the beginning of the show, all things work for the good for God and those who love him and called according to his purpose. Well, you know, this past summer they got married in the church mm -hmm. and they both told me that if they had not encountered that story, they probably wouldn't even be together anymore. Mm -hmm. And then there was another couple uh, about the age of Ashley and I, and they were infertile. They just couldn't get pregnant. And instead of taking matters into their own hands, they decided to wait and see what God had in store for them. And she worked with visually impaired children. And she went to visit uh, one of the cases. And when she got there, there was a woman rocking a baby with Down syndrome. And her parents were going to give her up for adoption because they couldn't afford to care for her. And she saw the girl and she said, you know, you could be her mom. Mm. And she said, oh, you know, I don't know about that. But she picked up the, the young lady and she fell in love with her almost immediately. Her name was Aubrey. And the woman's name was Samantha and her husband's name was Bobby. And they became foster parents for her for a period of time before someone would decide to adopt her. And as they were discerning whether or not they wanted to adopt her or not because they kept falling more and more in love with her, somebody who I had spoken to uh, got my book and said, you need to read this book. Mm. And they read the book. And when they got through reading Waiting for Eli, she said she got all these signs while reading it. And she knew in that moment, and her husband did too, that this was the child that God had intended for them to have. Mm. So a child that, you know, was diagnosed with Down syndrome, in utero, I think it's like a 90% abortion right. rate for children with mm -hmm. Down syndrome, which even tops Eli's statistic of 80%. Mm -hmm. A child that wouldn't even have a family now has a mother and father. And a mother and father who couldn't have a child found the child that God had created mm -hmm. specifically for them. Yeah. So, you know, I see that I can really relate to St. Paul when he writes to the Colossians, you know, because now I can rejoice in my sufferings for their sake. Mm -hmm. For in my flesh I complete what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ yeah. for the sake of his body, mm -hmm. the church. Beautiful. Amen. Beautifully Thank said. you. Well, we have a call, and this is Susan from Indiana. Susan, welcome to At Home with Jim and Joy. Your question or your comment for Chad? Um, I wanted to say that uh, my husband and I were married 42 years ago, and um, we wanted to have a family very much, 
But in a few years' time, we found out that my husband would not be able to have children, but we had briefly talked about it before we were married and decided if that happened, we would adopt. And so we prayed, and uh, we lit a lot of candles in front of our Our Lady, uh, for three years, and then we got our daughter, Mary Ellen, and and then we prayed another three years in front of St. Joseph and lit candles to him, and so then we got our son, Joseph, and then after that, we decided we would adopt in a special needs category, and so we did. We My husband had prayed for years for twins, unbeknownst to me, but um, there were twins that were born, and the one twin had had a stroke in utero, and she had multiple handicaps, and no one, they they tried to find a home with 12 different couples, but they were unable to, and so um, we were eventually uh, allowed to adopt uh, Julie as well, and so um, uh, Suzanne, as it turns out, had a different name, but we named her the same name as her mother, which was my name as well, Susan Marie. And so now my now all this time later, my son and his and our daughter-in-law are wanting to have children very much, but they're in a similar situation. Only my son can't have children because of testicular cancer. And so I would ask for prayers so that they would choose to adopt or to do whatever God has in mind for them in this situation. Susan, thank you so much for this wonderful witness and just teeming with life and and placing before all of us here just uh, the rightness and wonder of adoption. It's, it's just beautiful. Children are such a blessing. Your thoughts, Chad? I think it's beautiful that somebody would adopt a special needs mm-hmm. child. I'm, I'm reminded of Matthew 25 where Jesus says, you know, when you do this to the least of these, you do mm-hmm. it to me. Mm-hmm. And I often tell people that I encounter, you know, I don't have to go find the weak Right. the ill, the suffering. And I think that's part of the blessing of Eli's life. And I'm sure it's part of the blessing mm-hmm. of their child's life mm-hmm. that you get to do service to God on a daily basis because you really see Jesus in those people. And I think Eli and other kids like him, God uses all of them mm-hmm. to make his work visible in the lives of other people if they really want to see right. his presence in their life. Yeah. So, yeah. so beautiful. Well, we have Gina calling from Ohio. Gina, welcome to At Home with Jim and Joy. Your question or your comment for Chad. Hi, um, I just want to thank you so much for um, writing the book and, and being on TV to share your story. Um, my name is Gina, and I have a daughter with spina bifida. Um, she's 15, and she's a blessing. And um, a lot of people don't realize when they have a child with, with a disability that it, it actually is a blessing to you. And it just opens up your mind to uh, new worlds and many different people and inspirations. And she, she's been an inspiration to many people. Um, and Guy has really worked through her um, in many ways, too. So I can really relate to your story. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gina. We continue to hear what the theme that you're speaking about, that somehow Eli um, special needs children yes. or uh, and others, the weak, the helpless, somehow they begin to reveal the work of God in us. Mm. They do. Somehow God uses them to evangelize us. Yes. And that's a beautiful, powerful mystery. Well, I go back to the, the same thing is that the, the blind man wants to see. And every mm-hmm. time Jesus performs a physical miracle, there's always a spiritual meaning behind it. Right. And it's that the idea that these people will remain spiritually blind mm-hmm. to the presence of God in their life until they encounter God himself, just like this man did. And then when they encounter God himself, mm-hmm. then God can work something in their life. So the purpose of that illness was for God to work that miracle in their life. And when people are going through something difficult and they encounter Eli's story and they see the way that he has transformed our lives and the lives of other people, perhaps their spiritual blindness will be, the veil will be taken away. Right. 
and the transformation that you know Paul writes about, 2 Corinthians 5, 15 through 17. I once knew Christ in the flesh, no longer know him in the flesh. Now I know him in the spirit, for whoever's in Christ is a new creation. Mm -hmm. The old things have passed away, behold, new things have come. Mm -hmm. And I really think that's what God does with people like this, when, he, when people that don't have this kind of experience encounter people with special needs. They see the glory and the beauty and the innocence and the purity of God that mm -hmm. Jesus spoke of on the, you know, in the, on the, mount, the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. If you can't see God in people like that, I would say you're going to have a tough time seeing Him in anybody. Yeah. It is so interesting. Um, we had uh, people coming through right after our show. We want more people during our show, so we want people to come down. Uh, but there's a whole group of people, and uh, someone was standing alongside this woman just holding her hand. And, brought her up where I was right here after the show and she's saying that this is Jim and Joy and I was speaking a little sure. bit so I'm speaking with her and she's looking right at me the whole time and then finally the lady says you know she's blind oh, wow. and I mean I didn't know like the whole time like she was blind but it moved me so much and sure. I started thinking about what was I doing how was I treating her yes. and all I could do is just take her hand and kiss her hand you know I just kissed her hand because she couldn't see and so I kissed her hand and the lady would like to say next to her say well that was nice wasn't it so mm -hmm. I, yeah <laughs> yeah but but you know it, it stirred up so much in me, sure. this person that was experiencing what I consider a weakness with being able yeah. to see, and and just all sorts of stuff within me. So I think it's what you're saying. You know, when we encounter people that happen to be a little bit different, or there's a weakness there, it reveals something of God to us. It can make a profound change if we don't run from it. Right. If we don't want to eliminate them. Right. But, you know, we're often praying. I'm always praying, you know, I want to be all I can be. I don't want to go deeper. I want to whatever. And, like, how about a little suffering? You know, how about meeting somebody mm -hmm. awkward mm -hmm. for you, you know? Right. And that you got to say, how do I relate to people like this? And Well, I mean, you know, the world says compassion is to eliminate people from their suffering. And the root word of compassion is to suffer with. Right. So these people bring you into suffering and bring you to the depths of the, you know, God goes into the depths of God forsakenness so he can love us into his love mm -hmm. in that God forsakenness, which is what suffering is. And I would encourage people, I know it's countercultural, yeah. but I think there's a huge redemptive suffering message in this story. Mm -hmm. And everybody has a cross to bear. And if you bear it with God and you see it through, he's not going to get an answer in the first five minutes. Yeah. But at some point you're going to get that answer and you're going to know exactly why you endured what you had to endure. And the interesting thing is so many people with disabilities or special needs, it's like they're fine. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's like you're they're, the one that's right. kind of all mixed up here. But it's because God's doing a work in you through them. Like they've, they're already like beyond you in some ways. It's, yes. it's a beautiful thing. For sure. Okay, well, we have Francis. Francis is calling us from Texas. Francis, welcome to At Home with Jim and Joy. And your question, your comment for Chad. Hello. Hi. Hey. Go, go right uh, ahead. Yes, my, my name is Carlin Bernard, Francis Carlin Bernard. And I'm watching your show and I'm calling in to say, that um, uh, uh, well, first of all, I'd like to to greet you, uh, Jim, Joy, and Chad, and I would like to say that I was born with spina bifida. I am probably I do not know this statistically, but I would I would say that m perhaps I could be one of the oldest persons you know to survive and still be uh, still be functioning. I'm 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 seven. 79 years old. I was born in 1936. I was one of the worst cases. And of course, my parents, since they didn't have the advantages then to know ahead of time, like they, they do now, but my my um, um, birth was was very traumatic, and for my mom, of course, and 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 as I say, they had no way of knowing, and so until I was born, and it was um, the uh, uh, the the uh, the spina bifida was uh, at L four and five, which is um, a lumbar. Uh, lumbar four and and lumbar five and it was uh there where the um vertebrae are completely missing they did not form when i was in utero and uh then i had to have uh, oh also too the spinal cord was uh, was protruding it was on the outside of my back it was in a sack 
and it was completely enclosed in the sack, and it had to be uh, enclosed again, or it had to be inserted uh, into my into my body. And and the surgeon, whom uh, later he we learned, my parents had learned, uh, he had lost several babies because he was someone that did not have really any experience with with spina bifida babies, and because they died in that time. And but he did perform the surgery on me, and I I, I did of course survive. And uh, I will have to say, um, during my growing up years, it it hasn't been terribly easy. I have, um, I guess I can say this on the air, I hope it's all right, uh, of my bladder and, and bowel uh, functioning, uh, that is completely gone. I have to uh, use um, uh, means to, 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 to be careful and, and, and use protection, and, and, um, and it's because it's so low in my back is the reason that it is that way. And and but but I have led a, a normal life. I've I walk a little bit with a limp okay. right now. And for the last three years, I have been in a wheelchair, motorized wheelchair. But that's not due to spina bifida. That is due to just very bad arthritis that runs in the family. Thank thank you so much for your incredible sharing. That must be a great encouragement to you. It 79 is years old and she's like, she could have her own show here. I, I can know. relate to everything she said. I mean, uh, you know, we've had the similar issues with Eli and I would say that I don't want anybody to get the idea that this is a walk in the park, because mm -hmm. it's not. Mm -hmm. You know, we've had several major surgeries with Eli. He almost died in 2011. I have a great documentary film on YouTube where I tell that story mm -hmm. about how we got the intercession of a, a blessed in New Orleans, about a mile away from the hospital where we were at, who I had been asking for intercession for a long time. He had a cyst that caused a problem with his shunt. He had a shunt malfunction, mm -hmm. and we had to have almost three major surgeries in one weekend, mm -hmm. or an Easter weekend. Mm -hmm. And the, the cyst shrunk 75% overnight to prevent a third surgery, and the doctors didn't know how to explain it. Mm -hmm. And just recently, you know, to more to what she was saying, Eli had a major surgery done this year. On his, uh, on, he took part of his skull out mm -hmm. and two vertebrae to alleviate part of his cerebellum, putting pressure on his spinal cord and creating problems for him. He also has epilepsy. So mm -hmm. all the stuff that Eli is uh, going through, despite all that, he has come out of it. He's, mm -hmm. he's doing wonderful. And, you know, we're ready to embrace whatever challenge that God has for him. He is mentally above average intelligence. I want to tell everybody that, mm -hmm. you know, out there because people said he wouldn't be. Mm -hmm. And he was in a pre-K three and pre-K four program at a Catholic school, but we had to begin homeschooling him because when his epilepsy got really difficult yeah. to handle, mm -hmm. it was hard for him to provide the services he needed at the mm -hmm. school, you know, mm -hmm. for him to be able to continue to be yeah. there. Yeah. But he's doing really well. Wonderful. Are you still able to, when we met you down in Pensacola yeah. at a, at a pro-life banquet yes. and I want to I hope you're still going out and speaking because I want our people to know it was one of the most riveting and powerful talks because it's more than a talk I mean you're a witness you're what yes. one of the Holy Fathers has said a credible witness and your family is that I mean this thing is just unpacking before your very eyes and we need to hear it so much so are you still able to go out and do that absolutely and I want to encourage everybody I, I think you guys have put my website up a mm -hmm. couple of times please mm -hmm. go to the website and if you have a banquet or an event and you need an inspirational story that everybody will be moved by and relate mm -hmm. to. I think everybody can walk away, irregardless of what their circumstances are, with something that they can take away to help them grow in their Catholic faith mm -hmm. from this story. And I would love to go speak anywhere people would have me go. And I would, yeah, that's one of my goals, you know, is to continue teaching until God's ready for me to do this full time, or if God's plan is for me to do it, that and to continue to teach to do mm -hmm. both of those things. Mm -hmm. You know, moving forward, I'm, I'm happy to do either one as long as it's what God would like me to do. And you know? are you thinking about writing another book or are you in process of that? I actually have finished a third book and it's an interesting book because um, I think there's a crisis of manhood in this country and I think that men just don't realize who God is calling them to be. And the book is called The Confessions of a Cradle Catholic, A Father Transformed by Grace. And it's slated to come out by the same publisher as my first two books in the spring of 2016. It's kind of a kickoff of Augustine's Confessions, okay. mm -hmm. who I think has a great appeal to people today, believer and non-believer, that needs that experience with God and to see that tangible thing you're talking about. You know, right. Pope Paul VI said that modern man is more inclined to listen to witnesses than to teachers. And if mm -hmm. he does listen to a teacher, it's because he's a witness. So I really take that statement to heart when I go in the classroom or I'm standing in front of a group of people right. and I'm sharing this story or sharing how God has increased my faith. 
through Eli and brought me to full union with the Catholic Church and how it strengthened my marriage mm -hmm. with my wife and brought us into the full union with the church and led to us having a third child. And we have a 14 month old because I know a lot of people might be afraid to have another child yeah. after something like this happens. And there's a great story behind that and how it tied into me ending up at the Catholic school I'm now teaching at, Catholic High of New Iberia in the Diocese of Lafayette, sophomores and seniors. Christology, ecclesiology, <laughs> theology of the body and, so, and social Beautiful. justice. So I'm a busy guy. You are, well, <laughs> God bless you. And Chad, thank you so much for coming and telling God's story with his great work in your life and Ashley's and Eli and your entire family. And we met your, your parents and I know that is affected and there is a great reach and so we just want to thank you so much for sharing your beautiful story and your beautiful witness. Well thank you so much for having me on the program. It was an honor and a privilege to be here and to stand with you for life today. Well God bless you. Well when we come back we'll be with Father John Paul and we'll also get to hear from Joan. So don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Well, you are an important part of the family, and we want you to join us live at home. And so you can contact the Pilgrim Department, and you could go to pilgrimages at EWTN.com, or you can always just call the simple number, 205-271-2966. Come down with your church group. Just come on down, whether you're traveling and you want to go to Hansville and see the shrine. There's so many wonderful things to do. So come on down to Alabama. We would love to have you. Well, right now we have Father John Paul with us. Yes, and Father, you've been away for a little while, it's but um, we're glad to have you back. And sure. right now we're going to go to beautiful Joan, who is in Rome. Joan, what do you have for us today? Well, greetings to everyone from beautiful, eternal Rome on an unseasonably warm November day. Probably in some places we'd call it an Indian summer day. In Italy, they call it St. Martin's Day, actually for the November 11th Feast of St. Martin of Tours. Now this week, I absolutely have to bring you Pope Francis's general audience of yesterday. It was totally remarkable, some very amusing moments, some very serious moments, but he talked about the importance of togetherness in a family and especially around a table. He said the symbol of togetherness, conviviality, its icon, is the family gathered around the table, partaking of a meal together, but not merely food, sentiments, stories, and events. It's a very basic experience, he said. When there's a celebration like a birthday or an anniversary, the family always gathers around the table. And in some cultures, as a matter of fact, it's traditional to be with those at table who are bereaved, who have recently lost a loved one. But today, said the Pope, this togetherness does, seems to be lost. This is a very precious resource that seems to be disappearing. And he said today, if and when people sit at table together, they're often on their smartphones or their tablets or they're looking at TV. And they're not looking at each other or talking or listening. And he said there's silence. We absolutely cannot have silence at table. That can't be. Now, the Pope said, family unity or the lack thereof can be seen at the table. So he said, leave the tablets, the television, the cell phones, leave them elsewhere. Sit down together, enjoy a meal, talk, laugh, listen, have a great time. And he said, there must be no silences. And then very beautifully, from the model of the Eucharist of Christ sharing at the Last Supper, he said, comes the most beautiful icon of the family, a family united around a domestic dinner table where we feel the sharing and see the sharing of the lives of family members. So beautiful words. I think we can relate to everything Francis said, but time's up, so back to you at home. Thank you, Joan. Joan always brings such a powerful word, and this one is a very practical one from the Holy Father. It is togetherness, and uh, just growing up, being at around the dinner table was so important. Um, and I think, you know, you'll hear this probably from my mom when you interview her for the Thanksgiving show, how important it was that we gather around the table. That was very important when my brother and my dad would come up and eat. We would have conversations with one another. And so often today where 
we go out to dinner and, and we see a family come in and everybody's on their cell phone. Mm -hmm. You know, I, there was one instance I went into a restaurant and there was a beautiful family, had uh, three kids, and the parents were totally detached mm -hmm. from their kids. Mm -hmm. The son was sitting across from his father, and the son had his iPhone, mm -hmm. smartphone, he was texting underneath the table as if nobody saw him. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And I couldn't help but I, I wanted to get up out of my seat mm -hmm. and wanted to go over to the father and say, um, your son needs you. Yeah. Because you know, even the father was, he didn't even, he wasn't um, connected. engaged. He mm -hmm. wasn't connected. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so important and, and a very practical thing parents could do, and I would encourage this, is just to have a basket. And at mealtime, say, here's let's your, collect let's things. collect your cell phones, mm -hmm. your mm -hmm. smartphones, and even put your own in there mm -hmm. and put it off to the side. Mm -hmm. And it may be painful at first for kids. It may be very painful, but, you know. Well, I love it when they say, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about us. Life. We're going to talk about life. what we did today. We're going to talk about this great meal that I cooked for you. You're going to tell me how great it yeah. is. How was school? <laughs> yeah. How are you doing? We're going to have a conversation. Yeah. And that's the fear, is that there is a, a generation coming forth. They don't know how to have a conversation. Yeah, uh, and, I, and I've, I've encountered that already in my two years of priesthood, mm -hmm. you know, in dealing with a younger generation. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the concerns that I have. How, how do we, as, as ministers of the gospel, uh, communicate the gospel message to a generation that has trouble receiving mm -hmm. communication. You know, they receive, communi they communicate in sound bites. Right. They talk to one another through a medium, mm -hmm. through email, through texting, mm -hmm. not through real encounters. Right. And Pope Francis, Pope John Paul II, mm -hmm. Pope Benedict XVI, right. constantly talked about encountering mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. You need to encounter people. First of all, you need to encounter God. Mm -hmm. You know, God's not going to send you a text. Right. You know, the, the relationship that we have with He's God. He's given us the written word. See, that's. And He gave us His you know, the, Son. Yeah, the relationships that we have with the Lord and with one another are far greater than mm -hmm. any relationship that right. we can have over a texting match back and forth. Mm -hmm. back and forth. Uh, I think of the Bible verse that says, you know, we're the apple of God's eye. Mm. And I like to share that with my grandkids and with sure. others that you should be able to see yourself in my eyes. I <coughs> want you to be the apple of my eye, and I'd like to be the apple of your eye. I think that would be kind of interesting to have that conversation. What are you talking about? You know, I want you to see yourself you know, in, in my eyes. I had my aunt who raised me after my mother's death, sure. my Aunt Anna, and uh, she's still with us. She's 93 years old. I have another aunt that's watching too, 98 years old, so okay. But my Aunt sure. Anna, as I was growing up, and, and even to this day, and I've said this before, I'll say it a million times, but she would say to me, she'd come up to me and also she'd start looking at me and she'd say, look, J Jesus, hmm. look. She, she'd be looking into my eyes and she, I, I'd be like a little scared. I'd be like, Whoa. but sure. now I get it because she was sure. really looking. And so this is, you've got to teach this. Somebody's got to do this for you. Sure. Part of the problem is it's not the kids, it's the parents. That we're not very intimate. We're not conversational. We're not giving the gift of, of listening to one another and for looking for the face of Jesus. When somebody sure. says, I see, then you start looking for the face of Christ in others. Sure, 75% of a good conversation is listening. Listening, mm -hmm. listening to somebody. Okay. okay, I have Just to read an email. Sure. It says this, blessings to you for this show. The love of my life was born with spina bifida. Oh, he was a wonderful man, full of courage, patience, and love in spite of his mm -hmm. handicap. It was his cross for 75 years, and he carried it well. Praise God that we are blessed with 45 years of marriage. Mm. I look forward to meeting again in wow. the eternal life with yeah. the Lord. And this was from a listener. So while that show was going on, you saw that email come through, right, Father? We've had some incredible calls, mm -hmm. some incredible emails for this show. I think suffering brings out things in people. It brings... Um, us to the surface, mm -hmm. to reality. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I once heard a priest say that suffering is like a divine megaphone mm. that awakens a dull and drowsy world. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, C.S. Lewis, um, he has a quote, and see if I can remember it. He says, there are places in the human heart that have no existence. Man enters into those deepest places suffering in order to give them existence. Mm. 
It is suffering that expands the capacity of the human heart to love. Mm -hmm. Now think about that for a minute. Every one of us has encountered some suffering in our life. Any suffering that we've encountered, or maybe we've encountered someone with suffering, it's like it pushes on the it walls does. of our hearts. It does. <laughs> and, it, and, and that's God. And it that's extends God. us. Yeah, it yes. extends us, mm -hmm. and, it, and it helps us to become less selfish, mm -hmm. less self-centered, mm -hmm. and more um, selfless, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, more, self, so more sacrificial, more giving, mm -hmm. you know. To that end, sure. would you give us a blessing, sure. Father? Sure. Family, may the Lord bless you and keep you, and may he turn his face to you and be merciful to you. May he show you his kindness and give you his peace. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. What a great blessing to be at home with you, to be a part of the EWTN family, to know we're never alone in Christ Jesus. What do you fear most? Let God bring you from fear to faith. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid. God bless you. God bless all of your loved ones. Bye now.